We are in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3. We have been talking about this relationship between Paul and Timothy. Paul is the writer of 1 Timothy. Timothy is kind of a protege. He's helping Paul in the church at, at Ephesus, getting stewardship, I guess you would call that, and information from Paul to be able to lead this church. Paul's instructing him, and, and this week we're in chapter 3. All of chapter 3 is a whole lot about spiritual leadership. Bishops, elders, deacons, those kinds of things. Uh, we're talking about those, and how many times we need spiritual leaders in the church? Without leaders in the church, there's no way that this pastor can do it all, or his wife, and I don't want to, and it's not good for me to do, try to do it all, so uh, we need spiritual leaders in the church, and so that's what this chapter is kind of about. So I'll just read a, a verse or two at a time, and we'll kind of talk about that and what it means. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul starts by saying, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Paul is saying that the church needs spiritual leaders, needs a bishop position. It does say man. We do believe as a church that, and we have recently changed bylaws, that a man or a woman are allowed to serve in some leadership positions in the church. And bishop, sometimes our culture for what a bishop does is different than what the Bible would state is what a bishop does. And so we might talk a little bit about that. So it's not, in our denomination, not limited to gender. So a bishop doesn't have to be a man, it can be a woman. They are servants. Every spiritual leader is a servant. I've heard people say that, uh, I agree with this first part, that the higher up in leadership you go in the church, the bigger your apron is. In other words, you're, you're just serving. I've heard people say the higher up in leadership you go, the bigger the target is on your back. Although as you become a leader, not necessarily people, but the enemy, the devil, does want to take out leaders because if he takes out leaders, then you know, the church will struggle. He knew Timothy was a young man. He needed help in the church. And so Paul's talking about how can you set up the church so that it functions well and the pastor isn't fulfilling every role in the church. So if a man desires the position of a bishop, and the word bishop in the Greek, not that I get into Greek too often, is the word episkopos. E-P-I-S K-O-P-O-S and it simply just means overseer. Many denominations that's what they call their district or their state leader they'll call them a bishop. You see a similar word, how many have heard of the Episcopal Church? So that's a related word and that simply means overseer and a lot of organizations, denominations I should say will call their main bishop an overseer or a bishop. Some call him a superintendent. It just depends upon what organization you're looking at. So these are men and women of leadership in the church. They have a role to fill. In Acts chapter 20, you'll see that there are several bishops and overseers in one church in just one city. Uh, these were fairly large churches when you looked at them as a whole. In the New Testament, they would have a, they would meet in various places in large open areas sometimes, but they also met in houses. How many of you have gone to a, a house Bible study before? And, and some churches have house groups. These various bishops that are mentioned in Acts, many of them might have been over like multiple house churches. It's just a person of leadership. It could be called an elder or a shepherd or an under-shepherd. So they are servants of the church, related, not the exact same thing, but 
Uh, similar to a deacon who might serve in a church, it just depends upon the structure of how the church is set up. In our church, we have deacons. We don't have bishops. We could have elders that serve as both elders and deacons, but we don't at this point. So we have deacons, and we'll talk about those next week. It just depends upon the setup of the church. In our church, deacons serve as both spiritual leaders and financial advisors to the pastor and to the various leadership of the church. So that's in our church. That's how we are set up. So if someone desires to be a bishop, then they desire a good work. Not only a good work, but sometimes a hard work. A, a lot to do. There's a lot to do in a church. Can I say that there's no room for lazy people uh, in leadership in a church? There really isn't. We need to be uh, busy about doing what God's called us to do because what we're called to do, unlike other places, has an eternal impact. Now, Dan and I worked for Sylvania and Norma worked there, so Brenda used to work there a long time ago, didn't you? Long time ago. And we had the objective of making lamps, make them at a cost that the company could sell them and make money. There was no eternal impact to what we did. But at the church, there is an eternal impact. So that's why these roles are very uh, important. And so there's some qualifications that Paul begins to lay out for somebody who wants to serve, really these qualifications honestly are for almost any leadership in the church. It's here specifically he's saying for bishops. Uh, the bishop role is not chosen at random. It is volunteer, they're leaders in the church, and their position doesn't have to do with giftedness as much as it has to do with a call. I may have met very gifted people, but they weren't leaders. There's I mean, I'm not downing anyone, uh, but some people can be very gifted, but not be gifted in leadership. They're gifted in other roles and other things. And so what's important about a bishop is uh, that they have to have a call of God on their life. Going to seminary doesn't qualify you to be a leader. I help you, and you'll learn some things. These are spiritual gifts uh, that a bishop or that a leader in the church would have in their life. So what qualifies a person to be a leader or a spiritual leader in a church? Well, you got to have a good reputation because if you don't, nobody's going to have to follow, right? What else? Obedience to the Lord. Maybe we get to other leaders if they have leaders higher than them. What else? Desire to do good. A good listener. A good listener makes a pretty good leader most of the time. That helps for sure. It? Paul is laying out here qualifications for a leader. And what you guys all said is true. His qualifications have to do more with character than with ability. Now, character is important any kind of work in the church. Not just leadership. There's some people who are good leaders who don't have necessarily good character either. They just have a follow. What qualifies a person for spiritual leadership is that they have godly character. Does that mean a spiritual leader in the church has to be perfect? I haven't seen any perfect people yet, including myself, right? But there needs to be an attitude of obedience to the Lord and striving to do what God's called us to do and striving to live within uh, the character of this role. No one is, is perfect. There are goals for us to reach for uh, in order to be used as a spiritual leader for this position in particular is talking about the bishop. So it's a matter of the heart. What did God tells Samuel, whenever Samuel's looking at Jesse's boys, and he's looking to anoint another king. 
hear Samuel and Samuel saying, man, it's got to be Eliab because he's the oldest and he's strong and he's, you know, he looks like a king. But what did God tell him? It's not in him. It's not him because he's looking at the heart. God doesn't look at uh, men or women like we do. Actually, Saul had the look of a king, but not the character of a king. All right, let's skip on now. We'll read the, these list of qualifications for leadership in the church. He's specifically talking about the bishop role, but really, these fit almost any leadership role in the church. So, verse 2 says they must be blameless. Again, who is really, truly, totally ever blameless of anything? But this, these are goals to try to live by. You could look at it as blameless because God's forgiven you. And so blameless, the husband of one wife, we'll come back to that. Temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, we're going to go through verse 7. Hospitable. Able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, we'll talk about that, having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony. That's important. Among those uh, who are outside, that means outside of the church, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. First word, he must be blameless. We're going to talk about what it means to be blameless word literally means nothing to take hold upon. Nothing to take hold upon. That means that other people look at him and they don't find things to be able to drag him down. In other words, his character speaks for, it, for itself. He can't grab a hold of something and say, oh man, he's a liar or he's a you know, he, he doesn't qualify for leadership in this manner. So that word blameless is a little different than the way we look at it. It keeps this person who's in leadership from being attacked because their character kind of speaks for himself. Some of those people that, I mean, they just, their character, they just, you, you just know they are a good person. And the longer you're around them, you understand that they are. You see them, you see them in action, you see them in daily life. Uh, we'll talk about in a little, a little bit later on why you don't put a novice into leadership. Right? So those are one of the things that we'll talk about. Nothing to take hold of. The, the word blameless is a metaphor in the original language for like a boxer. So imagine this. They, it, how, how does a boxer defend himself? He's got his gloves up, right? And if they try to hit his body, he moves. If they try to hit his face, he covers his face. And so uh, here is, he's able to avoid these attacks, but it's because he has a true character, a godly character like God. And they can't get to him. They can't land a punch because this person, I keep saying he, but it can be a woman that is in leadership role as well. They can't get a hit in. They're blameless, demonstrated by their track record of behavior. Does a novice have a track record? We'll come back to that, right? But no, a novice doesn't have a track record. You don't know what to expect of a person who is brand new in leadership. So it's important that we don't put novices into leadership right away. Doesn't mean you don't give them something to do in the church. People need something to do in the church. Amen? Uh, make sure you have good leadership in place. So, husband of one wife is specifically talking about not being a part of polygamy. It's not 
saying you can't have married before and divorced. That's not what this means. Many churches take it that way. But this really means that the husband of one wife means that they're a one woman kind of guy. Or they're a one man kind of woman. Some take it that way. And uh, so this really shows us that to have character that they are faithful to their spouse. They have an affection. Their heart is given to them. If you are unfaithful to your spouse, it could mean that you will be unfaithful to the Lord or to your position of leadership. It could mean that. Now, how many knows that people sometimes were divorced before they ever knew the Lord, right? And so we certainly don't hold that against them and say, well, you did this once, and so now you're just, you're just done for life, right? Uh, that's not how we look at this, the husband of one wife. So they're not a playboy, not a flirt or an adulterer. They are a one woman kind of guy or a one man kind of woman. When I say temperate, what do you think of? Not getting too mad, okay? Anybody else? Reasonable, good. Means, both of you hit it, means not given to extremes. So in other words, like Dan said, not getting too mad, right? Bill said being, being reasonable, right? Uh, so they're kind of in the middle. They're not extreme blow up kind of a person, but also not necessarily a person that you could walk all over either. They're kind of in the middle. They're not in extremes. They're not given to extremes. They don't have big wide mood swings where you're like walking around on eggshells around them because you thought if I say the wrong thing they're just going to blow up. They're temperate. That's what Paul said. And then the second thing he talks about, or the next thing he talks about is being sober-minded. What does that mean? Sober-minded. Does that mean you don't get drunk all the time? That's not really what that means. What, what, what would that mean? They're sober-minded. They're in control of themselves. Okay. That's good. Sober-minded. So they have clarity or clear thinking. I mean, those when you are intoxicated, not that I've ever been that too often, uh, maybe once in my whole life uh, when I was young, but when you're intoxicated, you're under the influence, you do things and think things that you, that are not clear, that you wouldn't do unless otherwise, right? Uh, so uh, they're sober-minded. A good leader is sober-minded. They are good behavior. Uh, they are, well, this is a word you don't use too often anymore, dignified. Now, dignified doesn't mean how you dress. It means that you have good behavior. You act like you should. You don't act like the devil on Saturday night and like a perfect angel on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> You're of good behavior. Dignified. Hospitable. What does that word mean? We use that word some, sometimes. They're a hospitable person. Make people feel comfortable when they come to your home or maybe when you come, they come to the church, right? You're hospitable. You greet people. You maybe shake hands. You have, are familiar enough with them. Maybe hug, you know, uh, whatever. You make them feel welcome. Some people would not feel welcome if you hug them. You, you, you got to kind of know what that is. You know, you, you don't just uh, walk up and hug a perfect stranger. Uh, but you make uh, people feel comfortable, whether they're a friend or a stranger. You would treat a friend differently than you would a stranger, right? But you hope to make everybody welcome. Not given to wine. The idea here is that we are not addicted 
to it where you can't get away. They're not violent, is the next thing. Neither in public nor privately. The idea here is that they're a person that will let God fight their battles. That's hard to do. I've had some bosses that surveyed me that at times I didn't want to let the Lord fight my battle. I would have rather reached out and laid hands on them. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but I didn't. But that's what this is talking about. A person who's not violent. Why? What is that going to say about the church if you have somebody in leadership who gets in a fist fight? Not greedy for money. King James says not greedy of filthy lucre. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say they can't be rich. I, I know some pretty rich people who are not greedy. I know some pretty rich people who are very generous. That really finance the kingdom of God. So uh, it is not to be wealthy or to have means is not bad. It's the heart behind it. Give me all of it. It's all mine, right? That's what greedy is about, right? Uh, it's, it's all mine. I've got to have it all. I will do a greedy person will do whatever they can and that means like step over people, do bad things in order to obtain money. Paul saying that is not fair. The love of money. Yeah. Because the Bible says we can't serve him and money. So that is uh, that's very true. And it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Very good. They must have to be a person of gentleness. A gentle person. Like Jesus. A person that's gentle. Not quarrelsome. Can't be a person who argues with everybody all the time, every time. I'm about to slide this little thing. That's not a good leadership trait. Kind of related to this, but I've always found as a leader, whether it was at Sylvania or some other job or here, is to put good people in a position and let them do what God lays on their heart to do and not argue with them about, I wouldn't do it that way, but let God lead them. Now, if they get out of way off track, then I might step in and say, let's, let's consider doing something a different way. But I've found that a, a good leader will let people do their job and then support them in that and help them to become a better leader and not just quarrel, not be quarrelsome. Not covetous along the same lines of greedy for money, uh, but it has not necessarily money. A covetous person could covet anything. What does the commandment say? Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet his donkey. That's not money. In other words, I want everything and anything that's got to all be mine. That's covetousness as compared to greedy, which is more just about money. Never satisfied with what you have. That's what covetousness is about. And we know we ought to be content people. Content with what God has given to us and blessed us with. That doesn't mean that we become lazy. We can still strive. We can still own businesses and do ventures and start new projects and do those kinds of things, but we need to be people who are content with our lot in life. So, not covetous. One who rules his own house well. Tell me what you think about that statement. I've struggled with this one. What do you think about it? I've struggled with it in former life. I'm okay with it right now. One who rules his own house well. What does that mean? Communicating with family. Communicating uh, with your own tribe, I will say that. Are they on the wrong path because we led them onto the wrong path? And you're right. 
we cannot control somebody else's actions. Even our kids. I remember when I was young and I had little kids, and I said stuff like this. My kid will never do X, Y, Z. Anybody ever say that? Anybody ever live to regret saying that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, because they can make their own choice. Now, the Bible does support if we train our children right that they uh, will come to, back to the Lord. But uh, it doesn't say that they'll never, you know, never stray off the path at all. It's hard. You can't control somebody else's rebellion. It's just, did you cause that? And you don't want to be a person that has caused your family, not just your children, but husbands. We're leading our wives. That's a biblical concept, right? So if we're leading our family and we cause our wife to stray in some way, then we're as wrong as if we let our kids astray, right? I think we're the spiritual priest or head of our house. Not a novice. Somebody tell me why you, we talked a little bit about it, why you don't want a novice as a leader in the church. Haven't proven themselves, good. They like to have a baby go preach for you, okay? <laughs> so they don't have experience and they don't know how to react to certain situations because they're new. Not necessarily a character flaw. They just don't have experience and the know-how that someone who has some experience might have. Because of their inexperience, they could make decisions that would cause things to happen that wouldn't be good for the church. Uh, sometimes we struggle. Most of the time when I was in Sylvania, I, did, I had a boss that was older than me, so I and more, you know, time and more whatever, and so I didn't struggle with it. But now, like, right before I got ready to leave Sylvania, there was a, I'm just going to call him a young boy, he was in his 20s, that took over from my boss, and I struggled, I'll just be honest with you, in having the respect for him that I needed to have because he had the position, but he didn't have the experience or the know-how. But that's why you don't want, I'm not saying I was right in doing that. I needed to work on that. And maybe that's why God put that opportunity uh, in my path. So the word novice simply means newly planted. Newly planted. So think about a tree that's been newly planted or another type of plant. Newly planted. So they don't have a root structure. They don't have, um, they haven't had time simply to put down the roots that they're going to need. So they're newly planted. If you put a tree in the ground and put some dirt around it and you tamp it, the ground around it, and you water it real good, but it's a really tall tree, before it, and then before that tree has an opportunity for those roots to grow deep into the ground and for it to have structure and stability, and a wind comes along like we've had lately, what's going to happen? It's going to, yeah, it's going to fall over, right? Honestly, you don't want a novice as a leader, number one, because they'll probably get hurt because they don't have the experience that they need to lead people. And then the people could get hurt, right? Because something bad would happen. That word novice means newly planted, and it's important that we don't put a novice in leadership because they have not been allowed to grow long enough put down good roots. Because sometimes there is going to be a need for a young or a novice to be in somewhat of a leadership role. Even if it's not a great idea, sometimes it's going to happen. Uh, and you do have to have that support. You probably tied some strings off to it. I did put stakes around it. Stakes around it so you didn't run over it. Well, I see it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good, that's a really good illustration. These are attributes for a bishop. Remember that. We're going to talk about deacons the next time. 
but these are relatable to any kind of leader in the church. What are leadership roles in this church? What are they? Because I might define them differently than you do. What are leadership roles in the church? Pastor is one. You got some, you got multiple pastors, so those are leaders within groups. Because you got a youth pastor, a children's pastor, you got a senior pastor. But there's more leadership than that in this church. What else? Sunday school teachers are leaders of their Sunday school classes, right? You have a director of Christian education or discipleship, as we call it, discipleship. And they are a leader of leaders. Music directors are leaders. Worship leaders is kind of what we call them here. But uh, those two, they have, they're leaders, right? Deacons. They have responsibilities. Each Sunday school class has a leader. And then there's a leader of the leaders, which is the, the director. You also have Pastor Jason leads an area which is, we don't think about that as leadership. I call him pastor because, number one, once you're a pastor, you're, a, you, you're always a pastor. Uh, he was a former youth pastor. But he literally pastors that area. I don't call everybody a pastor, he, but he pastors that area, and he's knowledgeable, and he's experienced, and he has no fear to try something new, and I would. Like, all this technology, social media, all the stuff, like, right now we're live on Facebook. Kim literally called in to him and helped get it set up. That's a leadership role. Uh, if I had to play the piano, we'd be in sorry shape. <laughs> I couldn't. We just had to sing acapella. Uh, I don't have that skill. I might be able to tap a tambourine on time. Maybe. My wife said, I don't need to do that. She says, I'm not even good enough to do that. So We have Kim and Jim, who are over the whole breeders, and they have a team. They have different people in each services that help. That's an important role. They're leaders in that aspect. Those are things. And so when we look at leadership, don't just think pastor because uh, when there is a somewhat of a hierarchy even in the church, but many, many multiple leaders in the church. It's important that our deacons and trustees are, that's a pretty much a multiple role. Deacons serve in both of those roles. So some churches are different than that. It's just this one, that's how we do it. Uh, and the last thing that they said is a good testimony. Outside, on the outside. In other words, outside the church. It is possible that someone could act like a saint here inside the church and we put them in leadership and find out that they are not, they don't have the godly character that they need to have because they're a bad testimony for outside of here. And so that's the last thing that Paul uh, talks about here in Timothy. And again, what's he doing? He's trying to help Timothy organize. Sometimes as Pentecostals and maybe other organizations do the same thing, we don't look at structures of churches enough. In other words, we think, oh, we just got to show up and somehow it gets done and people get saved. That's very far from the truth in most churches. There are people in leadership roles that help facilitate ministry so that, number one, people inside the church are ministered to, we need to be ministered to, but then whenever a center comes in, that it facilitates where they can come in, they feel the presence of God, there's good teaching, there's good preaching, there's good worship. They had a great welcome at the door. They, we've got kids ministry and youth ministry for their children, and now there is an ease to come into the church and to get plugged in and get saved and all of that. So uh, the structure of the church is very important. That's why Paul is explaining this to Timothy. We're going to go through these right here to make sure you have something. You can put these in your own words, but make sure you have the, 
uh, basic answer to these. So what's the Greek word for bishop and what does it mean? Episkopos, and it simply means to be a what? Overseer. What qualifies a person for spiritual leadership? We said some things, but overall, what is it? To have godly care. What does the word blameless mean? Nothing to take hold upon. What does the word temperate mean? Danny yeah, said, don't get too mad. <laughs> Not given to extremes. They have a moderate self-control. What does sober-minded mean? Fair right. thinking. Does husband of one wife mean a leader must be married? No. Years ago, when we had younger children and younger youth pastors, they were married. That wasn't a requirement of leadership. All right, what does the word novice mean? New and planted. Why is it important that a novice not be in leadership? No track record, they don't have deep roots, lack of respect for any of those things. So multiple reasons why they might not need to be in leadership. But I do agree with Bill, that's a great point that when I started pastoring here, I felt pretty young. I wasn't as young as I thought I was, but uh, I was, let's see, I've been pastoring for 12 years, so I was 43. Is that right? No. 45. Oops, 57 and I was 12. <laughs> 45. I was 45. So, um, I see why you're in charge. I can normally do it better than that. But I felt like I was younger than what I was, but I also didn't, I had never pastored a church before. I grew up in church. I had preached multiple times. I had fulfilled a role of almost like a youth pastor and done some other things, but you guys surrounded me. Many of you had helped me become a better leader and a better pastor. So uh, I appreciate what Bill said about if you do have a new leader, you've got to support them and help them. 